This oh. conference will now be recorded. Okay, so it's being recorded. And I do hear a lot of background noise, so just someone who needs to mute themselves, please. If uh, you're not needing to speak, thank you so much. Okay, um, so I believe that roll call and a termination of quorum has been already uh, established, Annette. So yes, it has. yes, ma'am. Have everyone introduce themselves individually. Uh, what we'll go ahead and do is um, it's not on the agenda, but we can flip and see the uh, pledge of allegiance or seated. Allegiance. I will stay. remain seated. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you. Very much. All right, we'll go ahead and um, we do have quite a bit on um, the agenda today, so we'll go right into the approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. And I'm not sure if everyone has had a chance to look over those minutes. Um, I did look over the minutes. I didn't have any questions or any um, corrections uh, that need to be done. Motion to approve, Judge. Okay, we have a motion to approve by Representative Rivetta. Is that who I heard make the motion? Yes. I'll well, second, Mayor Leos. Okay, thank you, Mayor Leos. So a second by Mayor Leos. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? If not, uh, motion agrees, and the minutes are approved. And at this time, we would like to anyone who would like to make a public comment at this time. Is there anyone um, on that would like to address the um, Rio Grande Council Board of Directors on any type of comment? Let me ask Patrick if, if there's anything he'd like to update us on from Corpless with the IS, um, IGSAs. Okay. Uh, yeah, nothing, nothing to add for this meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there be no one else, um, we'll go ahead and go right into the into the meat of the agenda, which is the finance uh, item number one. It's quarterly investment report by Judy Cisneros. And this is an information item and no action is required. Um, Cisneros, go ahead. Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, Judy Cisneros, the finance director. Um, I would be presenting the second quarter investment report for fiscal year 2021. And this is for our three bank accounts held at Wells Fargo. Um, for the first account, it is our operating account, which is our main account. Um, this is where checks are distributed and payroll is distributed from this account as well. Uh, at March 31st, 2021, it had a book and a market value of $587,883 and it earned interest for the quarter of $491. The second account is our 911 account, which is our CSEC account. Uh, for this account, it had a book and a market value at March 31st of $87,008, and it earned interest for the quarter uh, of $54. And uh, the last account that I will be reporting on is our TCEQ account, uh, which is our solid waste funding. Uh, for this account, it, it had a book and a market value at March 31st of $112,000 with $26, and it earned interest of $31. Um, just like Judge Guevara said, this is an information item only that we do uh, present to you on a quarterly basis, but if you have any questions for me, I would be glad to answer. Okay, thank you, Judy. Um, if there are no questions, we'll go on to the to the next item. 
Uh, first of all, I do want to make sure there are no questions for Ms. Cisneros on item number one. Okay, so um, next item number two is fixed and or expendable assets transfer or disposal by Evelyn Anguiano. And this is an action item. Go ahead, Ms. Anguiano. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm requesting board of directors approval to transfer and or dispose uh, our fixed and expendable assets. Uh, the approved assets will be removed from our inventory asset listing. And in your package, you'll find four pages of mostly electronic items and some pictures of uh, items that are available for the board uh, or anyone interested in the use of them. Um, some of the items are being transferred also to uh, Culverson County Sheriff's Office and uh, City of Albany Police Department, and these are related to 911 uh, program. Are there any questions for me? Did everyone get a chance to go over that um, that agenda item in your packet before today's meeting? Um, if you did, there's probably no one that has any questions. So at this time, I'll entertain a motion to approve to um, approve the fixed expendable assets transfer or disposal. Move to approve. Okay, thank you. Do we have a second? Mayor Leos, second. Okay, so all those in favor yep. say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? All right, motion carries. Uh, no. Judge Guevara, may yes. I ask? I, I didn't catch. Who made the motion? Could you repeat who made the motion? Okay, Padilla, thank you. Thank you. All right, item number three is also an information item. And no action is required. Camino Real Regional Mobility Authority by Annette Gutierrez. Yes, supported directors, I know that many of you uh, already know Mr. Raymond Theus, who is the Executive Director of the Mobility Authority. But for those of you who don't, and especially in our outlying areas, uh, in our rural areas, uh, we thought this would be a really great opportunity for you all to hear a little bit about the authority, what it is that they do. Uh, we think that there's some uh, partnership opportunities that are going to be available to you if you were interested in participating in that manner. And so um, I am going to uh, turn over the presentation to Mr. Thea so he can talk to you about the uh, Camino Real Mobility Authority. And then hopefully we'll have some discussion on how you all can uh, partner up with the Mobility Authority for your transportation projects. So, um, Mr. Theus, I'll go ahead and advance the slides for you. Let me just bring them up. And... Very good. Well, you know that, let me thank you, okay. Mr. Theus and, and uh, Judge Guevara. Thank you very much for allowing me a, a few moments to, to talk about the Camino Real RMA. Um, at the outset, uh, my name is Raymond Theus. I am the Executive Director of the Camino Real RMA, the Regional Mobility Authority. And Annette, if you'll, uh, I think that's the last of the of the slide deck. If you oh, yes, move. it is. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. If that's it, and... I can wrap it up already. Just let me know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so here, here's a, a real brief um, agenda for us. We're going to talk about regional mobility authorities generally. What are they? What type of entities are they? What can they do? That sort of a thing. Then we'll move into this particular regional mobility authority, the Camino Real RMA, which is located here in El Paso area. Then we'll uh, we'll spend a little bit of time on the sample projects. I have shared this PowerPoint with Ms. Gutierrez, so she, hopefully she can share it with you all and you can spend a little bit more time on it because I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. I know I, there's some familiar faces in this group um, that, I, that I know, um, but some of you all that we haven't had the opportunity to meet with, take your time, look through it. My contact info is at the back and feel free to give me a call anytime should you have any questions. Um, and, and incidentally, just uh, let me know while we're going through this if you have any questions and, and we can do this very informally. Uh, next slide, please. So RMAs, generally regional mobility authorities, uh, it is a po political subdivision of the state of Texas. And, the, and as, as you all know, that's a fancy way of saying we are a governmental body uh, here in Texas. Um, we are analogous to a water utility, for example. When you think about a water utility, they're often very closely aligned with a municipality. 
but they do have, or at least in our case, we do have a separate governing board. Um, and we'll talk about our board members here in a moment. You'll recognize some of their names as well. Um, so we are tasked with developing, operating, and maintaining transportation projects. And that's, that's an important uh, term, transportation project, because the legislation that authorized our creation actually defines what we can do through the use of that term, transportation project. Now, thankfully, that term is very broadly defined. So it really allows us to do virtually anything related to mobility projects. So you'll see in that second bullet point, a list of some of the, some of the projects that we can be involved in. So it's everywhere from highways and roadways, that includes both toll and non-toll facilities, as well as rail facilities, ferries and airports, pedestrian and bicycle paths, uh, parking areas, uh, parking meters and, and structures, intermodal hubs, border crossing. Um, and that's an important one for a, an RMA that's, that's located on the border like we are. We could actually operate, we could design and construct and operate a, uh, an international port of entry uh, if, if there were a, a need for us. Mass transit systems. And, and then the last one there is an interesting one, tramways, which we recently um, have been working with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department to restart the Weiler Aerial Tramway. So we just executed an agreement with them to help them out with that. So as you can see, it's a very broad uh, list of, of tasks that we are uh, authorized to pursue. Really, the general rule of thumb is if it has, if it has to do with mobility or transportation, we can be involved in it. Uh, next slide, please. And I think another really important point is that not only is it a very broad list of projects that we can be involved in, but when you when you look at a particular project, we are also able to do any particular part of a project or the whole of it. And what I mean by that is when you think about a transportation project, there are all sorts of different segments of it. There's the planning of it, the financing of it, the design, the construction, the operations, the maintenance, all of those different tasks we can be involved in any one of those or any combination thereof or even the entirety of the project. So that's really important. And we'll, we'll talk about this in some of the sample projects that I identify later, because we really intend, the, the one of the intentions behind the creation of this organization was to help fill gaps. So in some of the projects we've sold, all our, our whole role was to provide the financing for it. So we went out and borrowed money in another project, we just did the design and handed over the, those design plans. In a third project, we received design plans, received funding, and then built the project and turned it over to a different owner. So it really just depends on, on what's needed. If, if an agency out there needs help issuing debt, we can certainly do that. Or from beginning to the end, we could, we could provide that those services as well. So that's what you really see on this slide. But in addition, you'll see that uh, we are like most other public entities in Texas, we have eminent domain powers. Uh, the second bullet is really important. We can cross jurisdictional lines very easily. And that's, that's really important in an area like, like ours because we, uh, by statute, are actually authorized to operate into New Mexico. So that means both Otero and Doña Ana, we could operate into uh, those sections of, of New Mexico should there be a desire for that. Um, we can enter into agreements and utilize grants and loans all, of all types, that's local, state, federal, we can access all of those, those uh, funding opportunities. We can issue bonds, implement tolls, fees, and fares for whatever transportation project it is. So, so for example, as we work with Texas Parks, if we implement the tramway, we could actually collect the fees generated off of those, tra off of those tram uh, rides and use that for other transportation uh, projects. Similarly, we had a, a toll facility that was up and operating for several years. We generated revenue off of that facility and, pu and uh, pushed that money back into the transportation uh, system in the region. So again, we can uh, generate revenues off of transportation projects and utilize those for additional transportation projects. And the last note there is an important one. We cannot tax. We're not a taxing authority, but we can receive and use tax proceeds or other assets from other entities. So that's an important point. Um, uh, next slide. So brief history about this particular RMA. The, the prior slides really speaks uh, in more general terms about how RMAs work. This particular RMA was created back in 2007 by the city of El Paso. The board of directors includes a, the board chair, which is appointed by the governor of Texas. And then the remaining six directors are appointed, they're nominated by the mayor of El Paso and then appointed by El Paso City Council. I mentioned, I touched on this third point briefly. We are, uh, our jurisdictional boundary is technically the city of El Paso. 
However, because of the, legis uh, the legislation governing RMAs, we cross those jurisdiction lines very easily. I mentioned the ability to cross into New Mexico. We also uh, operate very often. In fact, the, the majority of our program currently is actually outside of the city limits of the city of El Paso into unincorporated portions of the county, into Socorro, into Horizon City. We're helping Mayor Leos uh, with a roadway in, in the village of Vinton right now. So we're outside of the city of, of limits of El Paso uh, quite frequently. And also of note, we actually, uh, under the current legislation, we have the ability to cross outside of El Paso County into Hudspeth County as well. Um, so that's that uh, provides a resource to Hudspeth County should anyone be interested in, in uh, looking into potential partnership uh, with us as well. Um, and then uh, that last point obviously is another big one. This touches on the, the, the inability for us to tax. We are not a taxing entity. We are an unfunded agency. That does mean that uh, however we structure a particular project, we've got to structure the financing around it as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, to date, since 2007, when we were created, we've been in, in, uh, involved in the expenditure of over a billion dollars. I think it's roughly about a 1.6 billion right now. Um, and, and I mentioned earlier, we, we can be involved in all sorts of different projects. To date, we've been involved in toll roads, uh, international bridge tolling facilities. We helped the County of El Paso with their toll facility, uh, pedestrian and aesthetic improvements here in El Paso. We own and operate a bike share program. And, and we'll touch on these in a little more detail, but the point of this is really just to show, uh, again, the breadth of this type of, of agency to help with whatever it is you're looking to do. Um, and that last point, uh, touched on or what I touched on before which is we are very flexible we can help with any part of the particular project or the whole of it next slide please this is our board uh, Joyce Wilson you all may know she uh, obviously participated with this agency for quite some time in her last role she is now our current chair appointed by the governor and in fact recently reappointed uh, last month if I remember correctly uh, Colonel James Smith uh, formerly with uh, Fort Bliss is our vice chair Patrick Byrne with a dairy here uh, in our region, uh, Nicholas Lamantia, Marco Zaragoza, Dorothy Bird, and Silvestre Reyes, our former congressman, round out the rest of our board members. So we've got uh, a great board, really uh, helpful. And then the staff uh, consists of myself and Robert Studer, who is the director of finance. And and that and you'll notice, um, you know, the number of projects, the size of projects are quite large, but the, when the city of El Paso created us back in 2007, the intent was to create a very small streamlined organization that could really focus on uh, transportation development and, and mobility project development. So the idea was that we would be able to rely on the city of El Paso for fiscal agent services by way of example. The office that I'm in right now is a city of El Paso office, uh, phones, computers, all of that sort of thing is provided as in-kind services from the city of El Paso. And they've been a great partner uh, for us for, for these many years. But the, again, the point was, we're not gonna grow into this giant organization. It's gonna be a very small uh, footprint for us so that we can spend all the majority of our funds and efforts on developing projects and not building this large organization. So that's why you see such a small staff. Uh, next slide, please. So um, if you go to the next slide, we'll, we'll start talking about some of the projects. And I'm, I'm not going to spend a whole great deal of, of time on this, but uh, I do want to breeze through this pretty quickly. This one is particular important, particularly important because it was the first one we ever did. Uh, we were about six, seven months old when we issued $230 million in bonds. And this is a great example of how, as an organization, as a resource for, for the region, we, we, the sole, our sole role on this project was to was to borrow money and provide it to the to TxDOT. Now, this one's important because there was an agreement between TxDOT and a, and a private developer where they were going to build the State Spur 601, also known as the Interloop here in town. The developer was going to borrow money on the mar uh, on the open market and build the project, and TxDOT would pay them back over a series of years uh, based on the number of vehicles using that roadway. However, we were created six, seven months later. We stepped into the financing world. We borrowed that money because we are a governmental body. We borrowed that money at a, at a, at a much better rate and saved the entire region millions of dollars. And that's how we helped on this particular project. Uh, next slide. Uh, the CMP, the 2008 Comprehensive Mobility Plan, this was a billion dollars worth of transportation projects that El Paso region came together through the city of El Paso, TxDOT, our MPO and the RMA. 
and identified a billion dollars worth of major transportation projects that needed to get done. We, uh, we helped with a few of these. If you go to the next slide, Annette, um, I'll touch on one of them. So this is the Americas Interchange, and I, I'll focus on this one because it's a good example of how we helped with the other ones as well. For this one, the city of El Paso created a transportation reinvestment zone, which is very similar to a TIF district that used to be called uh, reinvestment zone. Basically, uh, what it does is you identify an area and those, those property values within that area, uh, once they begin increasing after year one, that incremental increase of the property tax goes into a separate bucket. Well, the city of El Paso passed or assigned those revenues over to the RMA and we used that pledge from the city of El Paso to go out and borrow $30 million from the state infrastructure bank to complete this interchange that you see before you. This is I-10 and 375. So that's another example of us stepping in, borrowing debt. That debt shows up on our books. It doesn't impact the city of El Paso's bottom line. That debt is in fact an RMA debt, but we're using the city of El Paso's taxing ability to generate revenues and to, to uh, build a project today that couldn't be uh, paid for. Uh, or that will be paid for over a number of years. So that that uh, model was used multiple times. So that was the Americas Interchange. If you go, Annette, to the next slide, um, you'll see the Saragossa Direct Connectors. We did the same thing with that same transportation reinvestment zone. This time we borrowed 20 million, provided it to TxDOT, and TxDOT actually did the design and construction for this project. So we just borrowed the money uh, for TxDOT in the city of El Paso. And in the next slide, you'll see a third project under that same 2008 CMP where we borrowed an additional $6 million off of a separate transportation reinvestment zone at the city's request. And in this version, the city wanted TxDOT to spend more money on the aesthetic improvements of the Trans Mountain Northeast project that they were building. Um, and so, of course, this, the TxDOT agreed if the city would pay for it. So we borrowed the money, the city provided an artist, we took the artist's renderings and flipped them into design plans and provided those to TxDOT. And TxDOT built that snakeskin pattern out on the retaining walls. And in fact, actually, TxDOT liked it so much, they applied that same, uh, those same visuals onto the Northwest as well. So it was, a, it was a nice project for everybody. But again, same model. Uh, next slide, please. So in 2013, we partnered with, again, TxDOT, the, the MPO, and this time the County of El Paso to develop a slate of about $400 million worth of projects that were important to the region. Now, this one is different because instead of a transportation reinvestment zone, the County of El Paso created uh, or, or uh, adopted an additional, op what they call an optional vehicle registration fee. So in El Paso County, when you re register your vehicle, you used to pay about $60, now you pay $70, and that additional $10 goes into a separate bucket, and then that bucket, the county assigned to the Regional Mobility Authority, we used that pledge and borrowed $108 million in two separate bond issuances. With that money, then, if you go to the next slide, the net, I believe, is the map for that, for the CMP. So these are some of the projects that we're developing on the county's behalf. The majority of these we're doing the design for the county and we're handling the construction as well. So that includes everything from procuring the engineering firm to procuring the and overseeing the engineering design plans, procuring the construction contractor, overseeing the construction, managing all of those headaches in between the idea and the opening of the roadway and then handing those roads back over to the county of El Paso once it's complete. This helps the county because they don't have to staff up for this program. Once this program is done, then we step back and they are uh, they have all of these additional projects available to them uh, at, at, with the use of the RMA. So that's the 2013 CMP. Next slide, please. But you'll notice it's the same type of model, right? If, if an entity has the ability to generate revenues, we can use those revenues to develop a program for them. SunCycle, this is an interesting project that was requested by the MPO here in our region. As you know, the MPO is a planning organization. They do not implement any projects. So they asked us if we would implement a bike share program for the region. We've done that uh, um, for this is going on almost six years now. So it's been a really successful program. Next slide. Streetcar, we'll breeze through this one. Next slide. Um, the, the city of El Paso partnered with TxDOT to develop this project. The city of El Paso agreed to develop the design plans for the project. Uh, they designed originally where the, where the streetcar would go, what streetcars would be uh, utilized, uh, where the maintenance and storage facility would look like. They did all of the, all of the planning work. TxDOT then agreed to, bring, pro, to provide the construction dollars. 
So when TechStop provided the construction dollars, they sent them over to the RMA. Then the city of El Paso assigned their design plans over to the RMA. We built the project. If you go to the next slide, you can see that the before and after uh, of, of one of the vehicles. We rehabbed six of those vehicles. And then if you go to the next slide, you can see what they look like in the end. So we built the project, put it all together, put in 4.8 miles of track, built a maintenance and storage facility, a power substation, several power substations. And once it was complete, we turned it all back over to the city of El Paso to be operated by their mass transit facility, uh, mass transit department, which is Sun Metro. So that's another way where we can help wherever the, the, need, the need is. Next slide, please. RMS 2020, uh, next slide. This is basically the latest comprehensive mobility plan. The MPO is now calling it the 2020 RMS. Uh, as I mentioned before with Mayor Leos, we've partnered to help the village of Vinton with the design of the Valley Chili Road reconstruction project. And we are also helping TxDOT in the city of El Paso with the I-10 widening. We, uh, in fact, just recently approved a state infrastructure bank loan for an additional $30 million for this particular project. Again, using that same model that I mentioned before, the transportation reinvestment zone revenues created by the city of El Paso. Uh, next slide. And I think this really should be it. Here's just a list of, of a few of the other projects. This is not, com uh, not exhaustive, but you'll notice in there, we're helping the county of El Paso with their airport. We're designing uh, expansion of their airport. You may have heard they're partnering with the University of Texas El Paso to develop some research facilities out there. So we're designing hangars to be constructed out there. They've, they're expanding their fuel farm uh, through us. We're just doing those design plans right now as, as well as a weather operating system. Um, we mentioned bike share. So everything you see out there, there's hike and bike trails, anything related to mobility, whether it's tramways, streetcars, hike and bike, or traditional roadways we can be involved in. So um, that's really it from me. Uh, I think if you go to the last slide, you've got my contact information. You can give me a call anytime if you have any questions about what we are able to do. And I'm again, thank you, uh, Judge and, and uh, Ms. Gutierrez for the time. I appreciate the ability to explain who we are and, and, and remind everyone that we are a resource to you all if you need anything in the realm of transportation. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Otherwise, thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I, may I ask you a quick question? Of course, please. Um, so this is a regional mobility authority. Is every municipality able to, to create their own uh, regional mobility authority? Great question. Actually, regional mobility authorities in their initial vision were only to be created by counties in, in the state. And the way that they were originally going to work was that multiple counties could create a single RMA. So, for example, NET RMA, Northeast Texas RMA, has, I think, 20, at last count, 20 different counties that have partnered to create a single RMA. And the point for that, or, or the reason for that, <laughs> Think about transportation projects, right? Those transportation projects normally are struck through multiple jurisdictions and multiple counties and, and cities within those counties. So the idea was if you have one RMA in Northeast Texas, that RMA can develop a project that runs through all of those 20 counties. And that's, that's how they've done that. Um, there are, however, uh, other RMAs. So again, the majority of the RMAs are created by counties. There's Hidalgo County, Cameron County RMAs. Those two are down in South Texas. Um, there is another unique one like us. We are the only municipally created RMA in the state of Texas. However, there is one in Webb County that is jointly created by Webb County and the city of Laredo. Outside of that, the current legislation uh, only allows for uh, counties to create RMAs. Okay. And Judge Guevara, um, well, if I could just let Mr. Theus know that just yesterday, Judge Guevara was talking about um, potentially manning up a an inspection station uh, for their um, railroad crossing between Mexico and Presidio. And so it sounded, I might be wrong, but it sounded like that might be something that you all do as well. Am I correct in that? Uh, yes, ma'am. Wheels are yes, turning real fast right now. <laughs> yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Annette. Yes, because so that, we, go ahead. I'm sorry, I keep speaking over you. I apologize, there's a bit of a delay. Um, I was just going to mention that within the statutes, that is an authorized transportation project. Now, I think um, your county is a little bit further away from El Paso County, so we'd have to look to make sure that we could assist you with that. 
Um, I know that we, for now, we can certainly operate into El Paso, Otero, uh, Doña Ana, and then likely Hudspeth as well. Um, but that, but if there's some, if that's something you're looking at, um, I'd be happy to look into it uh, for you from our side as well. Okay, thank you. I'd really appreciate that. There's several projects, in fact, but that's one of the main ones. Yes, sure. coming. Mm -hmm. And I just, how long have you been the executive director? Uh, actually, since 2008. So the RMA was created in 2007. Just by way of background, I used to work for the city of El Paso in their city attorney's office. So I was the attorney that that helped uh, petition the state to create this RMA. I drafted the original language and the original uh, resolution that created the RMA. And then I was going off in another direction, but they asked me to serve as the initial director uh, back in 2000, 2008, and I ended up staying here ever since. Well, I just wanted to congratulate you because I see here that it is actually the governor that appoints you. Uh, Actually, the governor appoints the chair, so I'm I am uh, hired yeah. by the board of directors. All right, but um, El Paso, uh, in the past 14 years, um, has changed tremendously, and it's it's just amazing how much better it is of uh, the traffic flow, and uh, now we know who to attribute all of that to. So, congratulations, great work. Oh. Thank you, I appreciate that. Obviously, there's a there's a whole lot more entities out there than just this RMA that have been helping with that, but I do appreciate the comment. Thank you. Any questions from anyone? Annette, did you have any comments or anything uh, else? You I would, oh yeah, I think Representative Nella wants to say something. Okay. Oh, I just wanted to say hello to Mr. Tejas and thank you for the presentation. It's always good to see you. Nice to see you too, thank you. Uh, what I would like to tell the board is that if you all are thinking of any uh, construction projects, transportation roads um, that have to, that would tie into economic development, the Economic Development Administration will be issuing uh, a notice of funding opportunity uh, in the very near future through the American Rescue Act, and um, and that's the sole purpose of of these funds. And so I'm assuming that. Some of the projects that were outlined by Mr. Theus for Favens uh, with their airport, those are probably some of the funds that the El Paso County did receive from EDA through the CARES money. Uh, they did receive $5 million. And so perhaps you all can look at a potential partnership with the Mobile Authority if you're looking at um, trying to uh, establish a, a, a road that's suitable to enter your industrial park that needs um, um, all the appropriate uh, um, items such as the, the curbs and gutters and and maybe broadband infrastructure fiber things of that nature if you all are uh, looking at some thinking that there might be some potential for projects such as that uh, we definitely will be sending you out the notice once the funding becomes available because um, it's going to be we think it's going to be about maybe 200 million dollars available to our region and that would include the states of new mexico oklahoma texas louisiana and arkansas so i think that this would be a great tie-in uh, where you all can utilize the authority and not have to deal with so many of the headaches that that many of our communities do when we're staffed at a smaller size and and capacity building is always an issue thank you annette thank you so much and again thank you for your presentation it was excellent appreciate it thanks very much thank you mr Day. thank you Okay, um, our next item is the fiscal year 2021 proposed budget amendment number one. And this will be presented by Annette. Yes, ma'am. So yesterday we did meet with our finance committee. We presented our budget amendment one for FY21. And just mm -hmm. as a reminder, as you can see on the screen, these are the reasons why we do our amendments. Uh, I think out of all of them, it's specifically to make sure that we're recognizing all of the funding that we have up until this point and any projected funding that um, that we may be notified of that has implications on the current budget. And so um, we had in, uh, at our committee uh, present was Judge Guevara, Representative Rivera, Representative Schwartzwein, uh, and Mayor Webb, as well as Judge Cano. And so as you can see here on this slide, 
our total agency revenue for Amendment 1 is at 9,836,234. And our total expenditures for the agency is 9,826,838. And so we're looking at a net revenue increase of 975,623. And our net uh, expenditures are at 985,791. And the, there are several reasons why we had such an increase for Amendment 1. Uh, this is common when we do our first amendment because when we're doing it in the summer, we're preparing the uh, budget in the summer, we're using um, quite a bit of assumptions in terms of how we think the funding is going to be for our new year. And so these are reflecting our actual awards. And then also there's some funding that were, uh, that were unexpended. And so we're moving those forward into 21 because they were not spent in 20. And then we actually are reflecting the, the new awards that we are receiving as well. Uh, one item to also note is that with our revenues and our expenditures, we're looking at um, excess revenues over expenditures of 9,396. So that's how much we're anticipating adding to the local fund balance for the end of the year. Uh, are there any questions for me or for Judy uh, regarding the budget amendment? Okay, that'll conclude my presentation, Judge Guevara. Okay. So um, overall, Annette, would you say that the uh, COG fared well uh, considering the pandemic? Yes, I, we did have a, a discussion similar to that yesterday. And uh, as opposed to taxing entities who saw some major declines in their revenue base at the Council of Governments, we were one of those entities that, were, that received um, funding above what we usually anticipate because we were being used to uh, provide additional services to our community. And so uh, we're, we're well positioned in this fiscal year with the funding that we have received. We haven't received any notification as of yet in terms of any additional funds that might come our way through the American Rescue Act. Uh, the, the one that I do see as a potential, and you bet's here on the line, is potentially the Older Americans Act. So there might be some more funding coming to us through the Area Agency on Aging. Okay. All right. If no one has any questions, um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the amendment. Motion to approve, Rep. Nello. Okay. Uh, and I second, Judge Gano. Judge Gano, okay. And all those in favor, say aye. 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 Judge. Okay, any opposed? None? Okay, motion carries. Thank you, Annette. And our next item is the Regional Flood Planning Group contract, and this is an action item also. We'll need to approve this contract today. Uh, go ahead, Annette. Yes, thank you. Uh, in your packet, you will see the entire contract between the Texas Water Development Board and the Rio Grande Council Governments. The purpose of the contract is for the Rio Grande Council Governments to serve as the sponsoring entity to the flood planning group. It's the same model that has been used for the water planning group. And so the, uh, the group is going to be responsible for putting together a regional plan that will be due in June of 2023. And uh, they will be able to accomplish this plan through the uh, guidance and assistance of their technical consultants and so the entire contract is for 1,081,000. Of that 1,081,000, 60,000 would be uh, set aside for the Rio Grande Council governments to serve as the facilitator administrator for the contract. And the remaining funds would be then used for the technical consultant. And so uh, again, this funding will be uh, utilized up until uh, fiscal year 2023. It's a very long, huge contract. It um, is. That's what they do at the Water Development Board. <laughs> and uh, we did have Ms. Valdez review the contract. Um, she did not um, identify any issues uh, with the funding. And there are quite a few provisions, regulations, guidance. And it is similar to what we've been doing previously when we uh, go into contract with the board for water planning. 
And when the when the COG uses the sixty thousand, um, Annette, for the on this, um, is it going to have to pay all in one lump sum, or is it since it's not until uh, since the contract ends in twenty twenty three? No, we will stretch those sixty thousand dollars out uh, between the fiscal years to hit that sixty thousand. Oh, okay. And so we won't be using it all in this fiscal year. Yeah, ma'am. And so, okay. as soon as we as soon as we have a budget approved, we're already anticipating more monies. And so you'll see, if if the board uh, allows for us to go into contract with our development board, you'll see these uh, these new monies being reflected in Amendment Two. Okay. All right, does anyone have any questions on the contract, on the regional flood planning group contract? Okay, if not, I make a motion that we go ahead and approve the regional flood planning group contract as presented. Second. Um, who's second? second? Was that representative? Commissioner Robinson, second. Oh, Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Robinson, yes. Thank yeah. you, Commissioner. And all those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries. All right. Um, the next item is, wait, I think I skipped one. We're on item number six, correct? Yes, ma'am. So our next item is, a, is an action item, an award for Technical Consultant Engineering Services by Annette Gutierrez also. Yes, uh, so administration is recommending that uh, for the Board of Directors to approve, uh, to allow and award AECOM for the Engineering Services for Region 14 Upper Rio Grande uh, Flood Planning Group. And they will be serving as the technical consultant uh, for the 2023 Regional Flood Plan. And uh, we did follow our request for qualification procedures. We did receive a total of seven proposals and uh, whatever that's worth, um, out of the entire state of Texas, we received the most proposals for our region. So there was significant interest in our um, 15 county region uh, because this, this flood planning group encompasses more than our six counties. And so there was a lot of interest. And so you can see here on the screen, which entity, which firms applied and the executive committee did review score and rank the proposal uh, which was that happened last Friday and uh, determined that the most qualified firm was AECOM and then yesterday we had our flood planning general membership meeting and the general membership did approve the recommendation from the executive committee to go forward with AECOM and just uh, another item to note about this engineering form I uh, I do believe that they have been uh, the firm that has been used by El Paso County for their flood management program. And so I think they have a, a really great understanding of what our region is like specifically within El Paso. And so I think that will, will bear, uh, uh, that will definitely assist us in this effort and get us that much more ahead because they have that understanding of, of the flood issues that occur in El Paso, but then they're also going to then expand to the rest of the region, which goes all the way out into um, up, up until Sutton County and up to the Permian Basin region. And so if approved, uh, we would, uh, the award would not exceed 1,021,000. Uh, and if you all allow us to negotiate with AECOM, we will then bring a contract to you for approval uh, at the next meeting. Uh, so that way we can get going with the technical consultants and start meeting our door proposals. Mm -hmm. What a perfect presentation of this item, Annette. I, I have no questions. You <laughs> bullet that needs to be hit perfectly. I don't know if anyone else has any questions. Um, but everything that um, you touched on, everything that has to be touched on, uh, regarding awarding uh, these services. So, if there are no questions, I'll entertain a motion at this time. Alder Mepadilla, move to approve. Okay. Um, and then, do we. Second by David Cantu. Who was that? David Cantu. 
Alderman Cantu. I think, yeah. Alderman Cantu, okay, we have a second. And all those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, great job, Annette. And our next item is um, to discuss the future of our Rio Grande Council of Government meetings. And that is an item by that I wanted to bring to the agenda. And I would like to know how board members are feeling about continuing to meet virtually or to start meeting in person. Um, if we meet, uh, if we continue to meet virtually, I believe that if we meet personally, we'll still be obligated to uh, to have the option of those who cannot attend in person to have them meet uh, virtually also. So I'm just wondering how everyone is feeling about, um, you know, meeting, continuing to meet virtually or if, if you all are wanting to meet in person. I'm trying to get a consensus. Um, there has been uh, some board members who have asked if we could start meeting personally. And just wanted to see the majority, what the majority opinion is. Yeah, Representative might be recognized. Go ahead. I believe that with the current current numbers rising again, I think we should be careful of, on, uh, of meeting in person right now, to be honest with you. That's the way I feel. I mean, if the numbers were taking a, a trend downward, I'd be willing to support you, but at this time, I believe we should be um, cautious about our, our meeting. That's my, that's my uh, opinion on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone that would like to express any concerns? Yes, uh, uh, Judge, this is Commissioner Robinson. Uh, I, I have have concerns that the, the meeting it may not be appropriate to start meeting uh, right away. I think we should wait a little while longer. Uh, one, because of the, the even though we made great strides as far as the pandemic is concerned, but we still got a ways to go. Uh, the, but the, by the same token, the uh, social distance, distance issue would be, a, we, we need to address that. If, if it were to come to pass that we will start meeting again, I think that we, basically what I'm saying is that I, I don't feel that we are out of the woods yet. And we, one is that we still got a concerned number of people that need to be vaccinated, and we still got people who are getting the virus. And we are, and we still have people passing away as a result of that. So I, I think it'd be on my end. I would say that we we need to be careful and not rush it. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Robinson. Uh, anyone else? Um, Judge. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I I, I kind of just wanted to um, I just give my my two cents worth and, and I. Yeah, in light of the, the numbers rising and dropping, and you know, I, I think it is still kind of uh, unpredictable of what the future holds in DC media future. Um, and I know that we are conducting some business in person up in El Paso and even here locally with commissioners courts and whatnot. But I think because El Paso, the you know, the population is so dense and, and, and there's a lot of, you know, once you travel in and out of the city, uh, maybe even for our own for our own benefit out here in the outlying counties, that maybe yeah we 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 err on the side of caution at least for the time being. Uh, with that being said, I think that the smaller the smaller groups, you know, whenever we go in and, and have like a uh, a follow up meeting with uh, first responders and then some of those other you know breakout groups, I mean the numbers are smaller, and it seems like we're better able to manage. Uh, ourselves and each other when the numbers aren't like the full uh, board, if you will, of board of directors. Um, and maybe as a transition down the road, maybe start looking at the, maybe at the officers to go in, which is the board of directors. And, and that we kind of phase it in, in person, if, if 
the, the those folks are comfortable with going to the con. So I, I'm thinking, looking forward, I agree with uh, Commissioner Robinson that it, maybe it's a time right now that we're we're not quite there yet. Maybe by mid 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 summer to to the fall might be a better time to really start to, to rev it up. Where maybe after the new uh, the newly elected folks come in, that could be something that they can kind of consider as part of their transition. You know, the new president and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that's that's kind of my 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 current position. I know it's. You know, I'd, I'd rather be in person, but I know I understand the thinking precautions, and there's no need to rush this thing. Yeah, I I think that um, we may all be feeling a little bit uh, zoomed out. Um, <laughs> maybe, but <laughs> yeah, that's a good word. It is the best way to proceed, I believe. Also, is to to be very cautious, and then um, as Representative Robinson brought up, the uh, the the social distancing is still a, a very important factor to consider um i don't know if anybody else would like to comment or to or to say anything i just would like you all to know that as your president i mean i i'd rather err on the side of caution however if there was a major consensus of those of you wanting to meet in person. I mean, I'm willing to do that also. I mean, as your president, do. But um, we could continue meeting uh, the way that we're meeting. And I believe that um, we are able to have good meetings and we are still accomplishing uh, the business at hand that's uh, important to accomplish. So I believe that we could continue this way is there anyone else who would like to make a comment or share a concern? Uh, I'll remember, okay. yeah, I guess as, as long as we're able to have quorum, we're fine right now. Okay, yes, sir. Go ahead, Annette. And I was just gonna say that if, uh, if we're gonna look at September and look at our annual meeting in a way that um, we could possibly do a hybrid uh, because I don't think that we I would assume that we probably are not going to have those provisions lifted by that time uh, and so virtual will still be available and not to put anyone in harm's way if they don't feel comfortable meeting in person we definitely will have to look for a venue that will accommodate uh, for the social distancing and to ensure that everyone is uh, the most comfortable being able to participate whether that's in person or virtually meaning that we need to have the best audio possible even possibly have cameras available to where people can uh, see who it is that's speaking uh, things of that nature and so uh, obviously with city council and commissioner's court it's a bit it's more manageable in order to to see everyone who's who's at the table but when we have larger groups such as ours, that's going to become a little more of a challenge, but we'll start looking into that now to see what that what that could be if there's that possibility to to go into the hybrid. Okay, thank you, Annette. It's pretty involved, it seems like, to actually go into that hybrid. Is there anyone else who would like to make a comment? Uh, not, yes, okay. this is Alderman, sorry, I I lost connection there for a little bit, but uh, I'm also concerned that it is still too early to, to do that. Um, and Okay, thank you. I think the consensus is that we all are all concerned that it is a little bit too early. And um, as Annette said, Perhaps even September, we're still not going to be out of the woods uh, so much. So um, with that, I'll I'll entertain a motion to continue um, having our meetings via virtual as we have been. Motion to have the meetings virtual, Rep. Rivetta. Okay, Representative Rivetta uh, makes a motion to continue having our meetings virtually. 
Do we have a second? Alderman Padilla, second. Okay, and a second by Alderman Padilla. And all those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. All right, we'll continue to meet that way. And uh, Annette, I guess you'll keep us posted on the September meeting. Yes, sir. So, item number eight, Public Safety Homeland Security Grants Division, Office of the Governor. Fiscal year 2022 regional priority list by Marissa Quintanilla. Morning, Marissa. Good morning, Board of Directors. Marisa Quintanilla with the Rio Grande Council of Governments uh, Regional Services Director. Um, requesting board approval for the submittal of the FY22 uh, first responders uh, regional priority listing and resolution to be submitted to the Public Safety Office Homeland Security Grants Division at the Office of the Governor. Uh, behind your agenda item um, is, let me see, here we go. We had a total of 13 applicants and um, there was a couple of changes that happened um, where we really weren't sure if we were gonna receive our regional uh, budget estimation. Um, just to give you a, a quick history, uh, the prior administration, uh, presidential administration, had indicated that all Homeland Security grants were going to be competitive nationwide. Um, so we really didn't know how, what that looked like for us here, uh, especially in, te in Texas and then for the other councils of governments throughout Texas. Uh, because traditionally the state of Texas gets its allocation from FEMA, then from there they apply the formula and then they the formula, the methodology to go ahead and provide each COG region with their regional budget expectations. So a uh, new administration comes in and uh, basically they did away with the competitive, the nationwide competitive process. Um, and so we did, the state did receive its allocation from FEMA and uh, using the methodology um, that we think that they're gonna follow, uh, which is basically the same, we're looking at an allocation of 994,330, if I can see that correctly. Um, basically, uh, the state did receive a 4% decrease from the federal allocation. And so that 4%, um, if we're applying it to the current um, allocation that we received for 21, which was a little bit over a million dollars, um, that is about maybe 40,000, 41,000 decrease uh, to be expected for FY22. Um, I do want to let you all know that um, don't know exactly if that's going to be our true allocation, but that's the estimate that we're using. Um, I do want to highlight um, application number 13, which is um, Horizon City Town Now. Um, this application, as you can see, that it does have a huge ask, over 700,000. And the reason for that was that originally um, in prior years, the state did have a different fund source called the Surrey, which is the state uh, emergency radio infrastructure uh, fund source. And the intent was for um, Horizon to submit the application for this communication project under that fund source. Uh, because that fund source is sustained through court costs throughout Texas, that fund source was not released simply because there was not enough collections to support project initiatives. So when we reached out to the state, the state had indicated to us at the time, it was the prior administration, um, to go ahead and submit this application under Homeland Security. Um, and so we did that. And then fast forward, new administration, thinking that, you know, was it going to be a competitive process nationwide? Um, this new administration indicated that they were going to revert back to the, the previous process. And so by then, this application had already been submitted. And so it was still prioritized by the committee. Um, did reach back to the Homeland Security Grants Division folks. And it appears, uh, Mayor, by the uh, that this fund source, the Surrey fund source, will reopen in the summer. And so the intent is to go back and submit that application um, through that fund source. Um, so that is where um, how that project came in to be because I know a lot of people did have questions in terms of um, you know the 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 amount the large amount in, in ask 
Um, but that was the reason why this application ended up under Homeland Security dollars. Any questions regarding the prioritization? And I know we do have a couple of committee members uh, here. Um, I'm not sure if we can, if I can lean on you for any further discussion regarding uh, the committee's prioritization process. Annette, um, I mean, Marissa, I just wanted to be clear. So on this, I mean, and I know I was at the meeting, but on the Horizon City uh, application, were we only ranking it, but the funding is still coming from the Surrey Fund? No, ma'am. It, 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 at this point, should we be fortunate enough to receive the full ask of what our applicants are, are, are requesting, um, then it would be funded under SHSP. Okay. Um, since that is un unlikely, um, it looks like um, more than likely um, the folks, um, let's see, I think it was not everybody, you're, you are going to have some folks that are not going to receive funding and that would include uh, applicant number 12 and number 13 for sure. And then applicant 11 might receive partial. Okay. And I, I think there's the, on the comments on applicant 11, you can see the comment notes there. Um, so they would, um, yeah, so that would be, if, if they use the estimation, if, we re, if they use what I'm thinking of the, the allocation of 994,330, um, yeah, there'll be a shortfall there with applicant number 11. Okay. All right. Um, would you talk about uh, what we had discussed in our October meeting uh, for the for the funding of the Rio Grande Council of Governments as a planning group? So, in terms of the uh, of our planning grant, Judge. Yes. So, back in October of 20, uh, the first responders preparedness committee members met, and um, there was a um, lengthy discussion in regards to the planning applications, um, where some of the committee members were felt that um, planning applications should be capped at a certain percentage of our total allocation. So um, there was a motion made um, that the Rio Grande Council of Governments planning application would always be prioritized as number one and would be um, recommended for funding for the asked amount, whereas, whereas any other uh, planning applications would receive 12%, uh, would carve out a 12% of the total COGS allocation. Um, so, for example, if we had numerous planning applications, then in this case scenario, I think um, the the funding for planning applications would be capped at 124000 I think it was, Judge. But in this case, we only had one planning application, which was the City of El Paso OEM. And so um, I think one of the things that it's important for this next funding cycle is to encourage um, jurisdictions to submit planning applications because I know especially in the rural jurisdictions some of your EMCs um, receive a stipend or don't even receive pay for planning activities and this might be a vehicle for you all to at least um, have some type of um, you know um, pay for those individuals that do those initiatives. Great thank you. <clears throat> Are there any comments or questions? If there are none, I'll go ahead and entertain a motion to approve the um, the priority list. So Who is this? Who? Commissioner Robinson. Commissioner Robinson, thank you. We have a motion by Commissioner Robinson to approve the Public Safety Office Homeland Security Grants Division Office of the Governor, the fiscal year 2022 regional priority list. Do we have a second? I second. Mayor Leos. 
Okay, Mayor Leos. Second, and all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. Thank you, Marissa. Great presentation. And our next item is also by Marissa, and this is a, an action item. It is the 2021 Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Funding. The CEFS. I think I said that right, that acronym correct. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Marissa. Board of Directors requesting approval to submit um, our grant application titled Far West Texas Region 8 Building Capacity in Response to the Coronavirus, not to exceed in the amount of 31,263. Um, also authorizing the Executive Director to serve as the grantee authorized official uh, to the Public Safety Office, Criminal Justice Division, Office of the Governor. Um, the authorized official is given the power to apply for, accept, reject, alter, terminate the grant on behalf of the applicant agency. Um, just to give you some um, history, um, we received um, notice that COGS were eligible to apply under this fund source, uh, and it was only made available for COGS. Um, and so we received an allocation of the 31,000. Um, and so our intent is to go ahead and uh, apply for these dollars and to assist our special districts, um, such as the emergency service district number two, and provide them with some temporary support staff. Um, as you all know that we've been assisting our member governments, special districts as well, to assist in the rollout of the vaccine. Um, and so this, these two temporary staffers will assist uh, special districts uh, with coordinating and planning efforts for of the COVID vaccine rollout. And um, so this fund source will take us only up to the end of September of this year. I'm not sure if the governor's office will extend the performance period, but as for now, um, we're looking at a short period of time with this fund source to move forward. Okay, and Marissa, do you have the staff already? Actually, Judge, it's the intent to go ahead and subcontract out with a staffing agency to go ahead and provide the temporary staff support. Um, so we, um, that is our intent is to go ahead and use not existing personnel, but to go ahead and subcontract with the staffing agency. It's a good grant and to good use. So I make a motion that we approve the um, fiscal year 2021 coronavirus emergency supplemental funding. Second. Second. Okay, so we have a second. Yes. Yes, Reda, if I can, go ahead. If I can just say really quickly, uh, because I just, just full disclosure, the grant does allow us to go as far back as February of 2021 for expenses. So we are anticipating assuming that we will be receiving this funding so we have already started the process of uh, hiring uh, uh, an individual through a temp uh, agency it's rmp temp uh, they're through the um, allied states cooperative purchasing program and so the individual started this week and so i don't want you all to think that we haven't done anything yet because we've already taken steps to uh, to provide that staff support to the esd number two uh, our concern was that if we waited until we actually received the award, that would be uh, very late in the game. I'd say, because uh, Muddy said the application is due May 11th, is that right? That's right. So it's due May 11th and then the turnaround, maybe the 31st if we're lucky to, to get the award. So I just want everybody to know that we, we already have taken steps to, um, to ensure that the staff support's available. Uh, with the understanding that the that the funding will be uh, coming to our organization at a later time. So, uh, Annette, we can all contact this uh, person, right, that's working already, that started work last week, if we have any questions on vaccines? Or so, what we, on that one, uh, we do have somebody that we're using our, using from our administration funds. Uh, we already have a person here at the office working part-time 29 hours a week 
uh, you can give her a call and she can assist with vaccination efforts uh, for the entire region. These temporary, we think that we can hire about up to two staff support full time through the funding that's going to be made available from CJD. And those individuals will be housed at emergency services district number two for the time being until there's another project that we may need to move them into some other location. So uh, from the COGS efforts, there is um, 2.5 uh, FTEs that are going towards uh, vaccination efforts specifically. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we had a motion and a second. Um, any other questions? Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Judge, may I ask who made the motion? So I, since I interrupted you, I didn't catch that. Who made the first and second? The judge. And I made the second. Representative made the second. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So we are at the area agency on aging. There's nothing to report uh, from uh, Area Agents on Aging for this month. Okay. All right. And the executive director's report? Just two items to note. Uh, there, I did attend virtually the Texas Association of Regional Councils uh, biannual meeting, and that occurred on March 30th through the 2nd of April. This was a rescheduled meeting uh, because of the winter storms that occurred in February. We weren't able to conduct those meetings at that time. Also, uh, in addition to myself, several staff members also attended the Scott Hole Legal Seminar, and that happened on the 31st of March as well. And then just, you know, I, we continue, uh, staff continues to find ways that we can support our region with the vaccination efforts. And so that has, um, that has continued. We haven't stopped with that. Um, and so if you all, so just as an example, before we got on the meeting, I mentioned to Alderman Padilla that there may be an opportunity for ESD number one to have a vaccination site in Horizon City. And so we'll be talking about that to see if that's something that they would want to go forward with. Uh, but anyone else in, in your area, if you're thinking that there's a pocket of individuals or community that has still not been able to receive the vaccination, if you like, feel free to, to give any one, of us, any one of us a call, Marisa, Yvette, or myself. And uh, we've I'd like to think have developed a, a strong partnership with uh, Department of Health State Services. And so uh, we can try to find ways to make that happen if you all see that there's some needs out there in the community that still have not been addressed. Okay. Thank you, Annette. Um, does anybody have any questions for Annette regarding vaccines? Okay. So uh, next is President's Report, and I would just like to say that we have a meeting scheduled for May 7th. Um, that's when we would meet in May, instead of our usual third Friday. Uh, will most of you be available to meet on May 7th? I'm hoping we can have a quorum. And this will be, Marissa, to approve the... The criminal justice um, priority listings. Um, yes. So there's um, just um, to all to let board directors know that um, the Criminal Justice Advisory Committee will be reviewing and prioritizing a total of 37 applications. And that's the most we've ever received in our COG region. Um, so um, it, it's going to be two fun days for those committee members because they're going to be they're going to be long days. 37 applications, consisting of criminal justice, AVOCA, VAWA, um, and then also some truancy programs, some juvenile justice programs, um, as well as uh, new initiatives for the um, commercial and exploitation of trafficking of children. Thank you, Marissa. In, in, addition, Go ahead. And in addition to that, uh, Judge, we also would have as an action item the uh, approval to enter into contract with AECOM for the flood planning group. So those would be, Marisa, on your side, um, would it be 
five uh, agenda items that you have? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am, probably six. Okay, so possibly six for Marisa and then one for me. So uh, if, if you all would be so gracious to um, commit to our, our meeting, we would have seven agenda items and we won't have any informational items or presentations. And so we will try to get you out as soon as we can, but uh, it, it really is um, imperative for, for both Marisa and myself that we get these items before you and have you vote on them. So that way we can um, be able to turn in the uh, priority listing to CJD and then also start the process of the flood planning uh, plan with, um, with Region 14. Okay, great. So I'm uh, very strongly hoping that we can have a, um, a quorum on May 7th. So please mark your calendars for that. I'd really appreciate it. Um, I don't have anything else except that um, there is a webinar this afternoon on the, on the American Relief Act. If anybody would like to join that webinar and you'd like to ask me for the link, if you don't have it already, uh, we'd be happy to send it out to you. It will uh, give us the explanation of what we can do with those funds and what the rules and regulations will be. And that's it. That's all I have. And Judge Guevara, uh, Guevara I do see Cassandra Uritia on the line from Senator Blanco's office. I don't know if there's anything she would want to announce on behalf of his office. Go ahead, Cassandra. Do you have anything? Oh, thank you so much, Annette. Um, I'm sorry for having to jump on a, a little late. Um, in terms of, let's see, of, uh, updates, um, as you all know, you know, we're in the thick of session right now. Today, um, on the House side, they're actually debating one of the, the bigger gun bills. Um, and so they're hard at work on on that. I don't know if Representative Fierro was able to pop on um, today, but um, you know, we're, we're moving through session. Um, this past week, the El Paso Law School bill was also passed and is moving toward the Senate. So we're working on that. Um, I think that's really it. We're also in collaboration with the, the Department of, of Health in terms of vaccines. So if there's anything needed from us um, on that front, please do let us know. Um, but I think that's really it. If anybody needs anything from us, just feel free to reach out at any time. Thank you, Cassandra. Please give uh, Senator Blanco our regards, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other announcements? If none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. The time is 12.26. I still move. And okay. that was, was that Judge Evans? Yes, ma'am. So, okay, motion by Judge Evans. And do we have a second? Second, Mayor Leos. Mayor Leos seconds. And all those in favor, say aye. 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 Hi. Hi. Okay, great. Great meeting, everybody. Uh, so everybody have a great week. And um, thank you for everything. And we will see you again May 7th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.